Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes, the last chapter, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. One of the things that we must know is that God, who created his moral law, also created his natural law. God created gravity. God created aerodynamics. God created thermodynamics. God created all these laws. They originate from him. And these laws that he puts into natural law are not to hurt us. God did not give you gravity because he hates you. Sometimes if you fall and you hurt yourself and you, uh, Miss Betty was standing on some ice and she fought, she learned uh, that uh, there's the element of friction and not enough friction and uh, her feet came out from underneath her, she broke her hip and uh, she found that gravity sometimes is not your friend. And so, um, so we've also learned two objects can't occupy the same space. If you've ever been hit by a ball or hit by another driver, you realize that two objects cannot occupy the same space. And those, those laws are lo there are not to hurt us, but those laws are there to provide for us. With the law of therm, uh, air, uh, a, uh, aerodynamics, listen, we can fly a plane. It's amazing to think that, you know, with that you can get a 747, uh, I think it's a 9 series, it's a million pounds of fuel and everything off the ground. How does it do that? Because it uses the laws of th uh, aerodynamics to be able to accomplish some amazing feats. So laws are not our enemy, but if you misplace laws or misuse laws, they can become your enemy, right? Um, I was looking at Justin Backus's hand, and I was like, Justin, are you painting your fingernails? And uh, he has two fingers that he must have hit with a hammer, and the fingernails were black, right? So... Um, he, and so he's learned that, uh, the law of two objects can't occupy the same space. And, uh, and so all of us have those things, right? And so those laws are written, they're unbiased, but they're written, God wrote them and used wisely, society can prosper. Used the wrong way, they can cause much damage. And we see what's going on with war and everything else. And as much as God's moral laws are there for our advantage and prospering, so is God's moral law. You cannot lie without it snapping back and getting you. The consequences are amazing. Uh, you, you do not get by by deception. You will, it will always hurt you more than you could ever imagine. You can't steal. You can't. You can't, um, anger, lust, all these things, these sins that when we step out of God-given boundaries will hurt us, but if we stay within God-given boundaries, we're blessed. God blesses truth. God blesses faithfulness. God blesses patience and kindness and love. And as we use and we walk in God's moral laws, we are blessed. I'm so thankful my dad taught me as a young, in a young age, tried to ingrain into me a love for God and God's ways and God's principles. I was talking to somebody today, and they said, I'm working with a co-worker who's unsaved, and the co-worker's 35 years old. He has, he's on the top of his career. He's making six figures, okay? He is rolling in the cash. He's got a wife, he's got a kid, he's got a very nice home, multiple cars, he's got it all. And at 35 years old, he looked my friend in the eyes and said, is this all there is to life? Listen, Christian, just because you're saved, you can take the things that God's given you and use them just for self. And they will only matter down here. They'll have no eternal significance. And they'll, if we take what God's given us and use them to advance God's kingdom, there'll be a joy, there'll be a peace, there'll be a reward, there'll be a God's blessing. The reason God's given us everything is for his, for, to advance his kingdom, for his glory. And we talk about the man that said, I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger barns. And, you know, I, I've got everything under control. And what does God say? Thou fool. When you die, who's going to have all these things? Isn't it great that we as Christians can live our life in such a way that we can have eternal reward? I love missions. I tell you, I, I would hate to have a bunch of stuff here on earth and nothing up in heaven. Here on earth is just a short time. 
heavens forever. I love faith promise because God in his divine wisdom says, I'm going to give you a chance to invest in eternity so you can have reward that you enjoy throughout eternity. And the Bible says those Christians, when Jesus calls somebody a fool, we better. And so it, it just talks about how wonderful God's principles are. And how important it is that we walk in the path of righteousness. And so here Solomon is writing, and the key word to the book of Ecclesiastes is vanity. He's finding he has all these things, but he's not functioning and put them under obedience to God's laws and God's purpose. He's, he's drifted from God, and he has, he has a palace. He's the wisest man. He has everything. He has horses. He has horses. He has more horses. He has chariots. He has armies. He has everything that he could ever dream of having. And he finds that all these things, he says, listen, he goes, I'm building all this wealth, and the person I turn it over to, what if he isn't wise and he loses it all? And that's exactly what happened. His sons divided the kingdom, lost it all. Uh, it, it, and so, and then so he comes to this conclusion, and listen to this conclusion. He says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. The problem with Christians is we lost the fear of God. We talk about the love of God, and we need to love God, but we need to fear God. It says, fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment and every secret thing, whether it be good and whether it be bad. Don't you want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant? What profit if you're at the top of your career, you have everything you want down here on earth, but it has no eternal significance. I don't think that's wise. I think you just fell for the greatest deception that Satan could ever give us is to live just for here. God doesn't want us to live in a way that makes eternal significance. So here we find a tremendous thought, and I, I just challenge us, be not weary and well-doing. I'm thankful that there's a bus ministry. I'm thankful that there's people that faithfully worked on the bus ministry. People that are faithful in Sunday school class because Tariq got saved. It's worth it. You know, I, I think of, of those lives that have been touched and molded because Christians faithfully gave up themselves to invest in people and make a difference in people's lives. People are eternal. We're about ready to leave everything behind for the Antichrist. I, I, I don't want to leave him a lot. Number one, so we want to look at God as a lawgiver. God is a perfect lawgiver. He's holy. He's a transcendent God who is a creator. Whose laws are wiser? Why would we not want to go by God's laws? The Bible says, lean not to your own understanding. You can rationalize. Listen, God's laws are the very best. When we apply God's laws, God's laws are the highest good. And when we walk in God's ways because we love him, God is putting his grace and blessings upon us. What more could we ask? I just look at how God's blessed Central with that parking lot. I, I, I'm just like, wow, praise the Lord for that. Now if we could get Brother Skelton to pour all that concrete. Yeah. <laughs> Some people are hard-hearted. Can you see the rebellion? They're just digging in their heels, right? Um, and so, but also think about this. Not only did God give us his laws, God created us in his image. Isn't it wonderful? You can reflect the culture if you want. It's about eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Party on, man. Or we could say, hey, listen, I want to live for my life for Christ. You know, I, I, I'm thankful for, look at the prayer requests we prayed over. Look at how many lost souls we prayed over. I cannot think of any church that prays more for lost people than Central Baptist Church. Do you, think about this. I, I, I'm going to get off track for a second. And I shouldn't, but I'm going to. I, I think back in 1973. In 1973, we legalized abortion. And who would have thought in 1973, after we were done, by 2023, we would have killed over 50 million babies. Adolf Hitler only killed 16 million. And in the back of my mind, I... I personally met two concentration camp survivors. One lady told me what it was like to get off that train and see the ash come down and land on her. 
and what it smelt like as, as people were perishing. And the churches of Germany were just not doing anything. We just pray, just pray and have faith that God will end it. But they, the preachers weren't saying anything. Very few preachers were standing up and doing anything about it. The teachers of that day were teaching fascism in the schools. The professors were teaching this stuff. The, the, uh, the attorneys and the people this day were pushing this. The reason why it happened was because the professional intellectuals were pushing this evil, pagan, satanic philosophy in our world. Is Satan a deceiver? Can't you see it? And one thing in the back of my mind, I said, listen, if there's anything that I can do, I'm not going to idly stand by and not be one of those people that didn't do anything in 1970. I didn't do anything in 1973. You say, you were only five. I know that, but I'm embarrassed. Listen, we have the opportunity in Missouri right now. Missouri, within the next few months, is probably going to be a pro-abortion state. And it'll be abortion from beginning all the way to the day of birth. If we do not get IP reform in. That's why I'm up at the Capitol every Tuesday. That's why I'm there walking, praying. Because in 2024, I don't want to say I didn't do anything. I'm there because I want to be somebody that says at least I was there and I was standing against it. In November likely is that we'll have abortion from this because there's a chance we can get IP reform in to stop it. So I'm just saying, hey, listen, the battle's real. And listen, does God love life? Does God love babies? Yes. Should we say something and be a part of trying to stop something? Yes. You'll see them just. You'll see them down the street. How many of you have already seen them getting signatures already? The battle's on, and so we just got to realize Satan's alive and real, right? And aren't you glad you have God's ways? For those that aren't saved, they just think, "Hey, listen, the, you know, uh, it's just a health care." You know, hold it. That little baby is. One, someone's going to come out of that room not alive. That's not health care. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse says, aren't you glad that we can do something? Aren't you glad you're part of a church that is up at the Capitol with a group of people that are saying something and be a part of that? Aren't you glad you aren't one of those uh, churches that say, hey, listen, there's churches on, on Easter that wouldn't even talk about the crucifixion because it's about death, crucifixion. That may be offensive. We don't want to talk about the blood. That's the way the new contemporary churches are going. We don't want to offend anyone. We just say blood. Listen, Jesus Christ says, apart from that, you aren't getting to heaven. And I may not like it. I may not. I, listen, it doesn't matter what I feel or think. There's one way to heaven. It's through Jesus' blood on the cross. And I mean, that may not appeal to a lot of people. But there must be the shedding of blood or there's no remission. And I may not like it, and I may not think it's, but God's way is always the best. It's the only way. And so we are to obey God's law. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, the judgments, which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that you may do them in the land wherein you go to possess it. Why does God want you to do all these laws and judgments? That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee. Thou and thy son and thy son's son all the days that thy days may be prolonged. Hear ye, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, that ye may increase mightily, that the Lord God of the fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. My dad said, listen, Andy, I don't know how long I'm going to be around, but listen, you need to learn to walk in God's way. You need to be faithful in your Bible study, faithful in your prayer, faithful to church, because if you do those things, God says, I'll bless you. One of the things I've wanted more than anything is that, listen, it's amazing to me that I wanted Andrew to be walking in God's ways. I can't make him walk in God's ways. 
I don't know. I pray that he continues to walk in his ways. But he's not, he's, he's 21. He's going to have to make those choices. And as a, as, a, as a father, I pray for him. And I know how smooth Satan is. But I know this. If he just keeps doing what I did, and I, if I keep doing what I'm doing, I have the opportunity to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's what I want more than anything. That's what I want for Andrew. You say, is he going to be rich? I don't know. And I don't care. I do care that he hears, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's what matters. So the question is, how did sin get into this world? Turn to Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Turn to Romans chapter 5, verse 12. How did sin get in here? Wherefore, as by one man's sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men for all have sinned. Where did sin come from? Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. Listen, turn to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Why did Adam and Eve sin? Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any other beast of the field. Do you know what subtle means? Subtle means crafty, cunning. In Psalms chapter 8, verse 3, it uses the same word, but instead of using the word subtle, it uses the word prudent. And that is a proper translation, is the word prudent. And realize subtle and prudent is the same thing. Prudent means wise. It means competent. It means, you know, a lot of people have a knowledge of God's laws, but they don't live it out in their life. They're ever learning, but they're never applying. James said, why call me, Jesus said, why call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things I say? James said, I'll show you my faith by my works. You should see Christ in me. And so we find here that Satan was very subtle. He was very sneaky. He was very deceptive. In 9-11, we didn't even know it was coming. How many of you sinned today? Who got you? Some of you did. Good job. You should be preaching. Right? <laughs> did all of us sin? Right? Is, how, how did that happen? Satan's a deceiver, isn't he? Satan's like, well, it didn't hurt anybody. Satan is, 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 is so subtle and so good at deceiving us. Listen, there's two types of sin. Sins of commission. Sin of commission is those sins we know are wrong and we do them. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not be angry. Thou shalt be, um, thou shalt forgive. Thou shalt not have vengeance. Thou shalt, thou shalt pray. It's, a, it's, it's, um, it's those commands that we are commanded to do. Can you imagine we have the opportunity to start your day out before God and say, God, I want your wisdom, your grace, and your power. How foolish is it to walk out the door in the morning and say, got it, God. I don't need you. How wonderful it is. How hard is it just to do this? Oh, God, I'm going to work today. I want to, be, I want to glorify you. Lord, help me to do my very best today. Give me wisdom. May you be glorified. And to take his word, and how wonderful it is to have God with us. See, God lives inside of us. God wants to be a part of our lives. God wants to guide us and direct us. Why? Ha! Ah, I got to take God with me to work. Oh, now I got to do my best. Now I got... Isn't it amazing how Satan twists the good into the bad? Isn't it amazing how if we would just say, God, all I want to do is please you. But there's a sin of commission, which is doing what we know, sin of omission. Do you know what sin of omission is? Is when the Holy Spirit tells us to do something we don't. There's a piece of garbage on the floor, we don't pick it up. We have the opportunity to say good job and compliment somebody and we don't. Sin of omission is God says, hey, hand that person a track. And we say, mm. That's the sin of omission. It's where we know we're supposed to do something and we don't. Those are sins of omission. James says, he, who, who, he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it is sin. So those are sins of commission and omission. Should we want, 
Why should we desire not to do those things? Because it displeases God, number one. Number two is we're missing out on God's blessing. How wonderful you just get out and say, God, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go about my life today, and I'm just going to look for opportunities to be your mouthpiece. I'm going to use your hands. And the Lord, I'm just telling you what, you got me today. And anything that I can do. Today I was, I was talking to somebody, and they said, oh, man, this, this decision at work, it is, I, it's so much pressure on me right now. I'm just really wrestling. I want to do the right thing. Do you know how wonderful it was, Brother Black, just to put my arm around that person and say, let's pray, let me pray for you. That's what being a Christian is all about. It's just saying, God, you have me. I'm your servant. That's all. I'm just going to serve you today. It's not about just not doing wrong. It's about surrender to God, make yourself a living sacrifice and say, God, all I want to do is glorify you today. Listen, people are watching you. Other Christians are watching you. And if they follow your pattern of behavior and they stumble and fall, then the Bible says we'll give an account of that. Listen, how we talk, how we walk can inspire. Man, isn't it amazing when uh, I hear testimony, I won't call the name out loud, but there's somebody that was just sharing with me. They just desire to be pleased. And that person, their, their boss is like, man, we need more people like you. And they're just wanting to glorify God at work. But how about glorify God at home? We are so self-centered. I want this, and I want this, and I got to be treated this way, and I don't deserve this. We're so focused on self, we can never be vessels of grace. But when we just say, Lord, how can I be an encouragement to my mate today? Listen, when we get up in the morning and God says, here's what I want you to get done, and we don't get it done, then we are not using our time wisely. That's a sin of omission. We know, hey, I need to get this done, and we get this done, and we don't do that, then that's a sin of omission. And when we do those things, we're missing out on God's greatest blessings in our life. Because God wants to use us to help others. Satan is a liar and a murderer. Has Satan ever taken a knife and poked it into somebody? No. But has Satan ever influenced somebody to poke a knife into somebody? Has Satan ever uh, inspired you to get angry? Has Satan ever inspired you to say hurtful words, gossip, undermine has satan ever used you yes so it's but the thing is satan's subtle do how many times do we actively are aware that satan is causing us and leading us to sin rarely right 9 11 we never knew that the the terrorists were already at work until all of a sudden the world trade centers fell down and all of a sudden we're like how did that happen Listen, we've got to be aware. Remember, Jesus, Peter said, Jesus, thou art the Christ. And Jesus said, the Holy Spirit just spoke to you through you, Peter. The same chapter, Peter says, don't go to the cross, Jesus. And Satan, Jesus said, Satan just spoke through you. Isn't it amazing how one second God can speak to you through you and the Holy Satan can speak? But when you actively surrender your life and your hands and everything to God to advance his kingdom... That leaves a little room for Satan. The best thing you can do is just decide, I'm going to serve God with my life today. Because as you make that concerted commitment, then what's happening is you're saying, how wonderful is your day? Your boss says, I need to talk to you. And you go, Lord, help me. Give me the words to say. Let me, help me to respond. Help me, give me wisdom. And you're constantly asking God to get involved in every part of your life. Is God pretty wise? Is God pretty powerful? Do you realize the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, Byron? And do you know who raised Jesus from the dead? The Holy Spirit. When we sing victory in Jesus, that victory comes from walking in obedience to him. The less we walk in obedience to him, the less wisdom and power of God we will experience in our life. 
Satan is known as a liar and a murderer. He's known as a deceiver. He's known as an imitator of God. The Bible says in the last times there will be many false religions and many false preachers that will creep into the church to deceive. The Bible says he's like a lion who lurks in the grass. Satan is a liar. He sets traps for all men. He throws fiery darts. Ephesians chapter 6. He blinds unsaved to the understanding of the gospel. Satan cannot be trusted. Listen to this. Isn't it amazing Satan got us today? Right? So what should that do? It should inspire us to get up and say, hey, listen, I hate being defeated. I hate missing out on God's best. Listen, how many times do you have to put your hand on a hot stove and you say, I'm not going to do that again? But how many times do we keep lying, losing our temper, starting our... The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. What God asks us is to start everything and put God first in everything. In our finances, in our time, and everything else. And God says, when you put me first, then I'm God of your life, and then all these things shall be added unto you. Once you get your priorities lined up, then God shows up. And do you know what Satan did? Satan said this, all I want Adam and Eve to do is to not put God first. Listen, what Satan did is get him to doubt God's word, get him to doubt that God's way was the very best, and get him to uh, lean to his own understanding. Eve looked at it and said, man, this fruit looks really good. How could it hurt us? It's not the biggest temptation. The thought that we can sin and get by with it. Here we find that Satan is presented in the garden and as a snake. The Bible in Revelation refers to him as a snake. He's known as a serpent, the deceiver. Snakes kill by suffocating and squeezing. A boa constrictor. Have you ever seen a boa constrictor? We had, my science teacher had one. He dropped a mouse in there. The mouse is just not realizing what's in the cage with him. He's just kicking back like that. And then slowly he just starts tightening and tightening and tightening. You see, when you lie... Pretty soon you lie again, then you lie again, and you lie again, and you lie again, and you lie again. And it's amazing how those that get into sin, the further you get into sin, the harder it is to get out. Because now you've got a bunch of lies you've got to cover. And now you're hanging around people you shouldn't be hanging around. Satan, by the time somebody wakes up, he has got that person so tied in, it's almost impossible for them to get out. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 2, the last verse says, sometimes the only way that somebody can get out is an intervention. Isn't it amazing that a person that's in a trap of sin, they're stuck, and that person goes to help them, and they're like, leave me alone, I got this. And you're like, hold it, you aren't going to get out of there unless... Listen, that's the beauty. And so the Bible talks about, there, there's a, the Bible didn't talk, but the Bible talks about Satan being as a snake, and one of the snakes is, the snake of, of a boa constrictor that suffocates. There's another snake that hides and bites. There's the vine snake. Have you seen some of those snakes? They move in the grass like this. And they'll stand up like this, and then they're green, and as the grass moves, they follow the grass. So you can't see them. Listen. There are a lot of sins that you will never see until it's too late. That's why the Bible says make no provision. Stay away from. As a Christian, I don't go to a bar. Why? Because I'm not going to put myself in a position where <laughs> that's what it's all done. There's not, I'm not going to be drawn closer to the Lord in that environment. I just, I, I'm staying away from that. There are some people that are always... They're always critical, they're always complaining, they're always, they just, they don't have, they have bitterness, they have all those things. Listen, every one of us have a way we like to sin, right? All of us are sinners, and we all have a way that we like to sin, and Satan likes to put us in those areas that we're most vulnerable. 
So Satan is a deceiver. Is there a lot of rotten philosophies in this world? Is he deceiving? How about transgenderism? Homosexuality? Feminism? All these isms, humanism, all these things that seek to destroy God's way. I just, I stand in awe at how deceptive Satan is. And how many, how much of this, how much of these pagan philosophies are being taught to our kids? Through music, through entertainment. That's why it's so important we know God's word. We go to Sunday school. We love God's word so that we are not brought into those deceptions. Satan's a liar and a deceiver. So Satan, not only there's the bow constrictor, there's the, the, the deception, the squeezing. Um, there's also Satan just poisons. The cobra. The black mamba. There are sins that Satan uses that pride. Pride is a deadly sin. Let me ask you this. Aren't you glad for God's laws? You know, if we're going to be victorious over sin, we just got to love God's laws. Listen, God's grace did not remove God's laws, all right? We don't have ceremonial law. We don't have to be a part of that. But it's still wrong to lie. still wrong to get angry. That's still sin. And we've got to realize that God's laws are for our very good. And the best thing we can do is fall in love with God, have a fear and respect of him, and say, God, all I want to do is please you. And the more we love him and the more we respect him, the more we will be able to defeat Satan. The wisest man in the world was Solomon. Was Satan able to take him down? A man after God's own heart, David, was Satan able to take him down? Moses, the meekest man in the world, was Satan able to take him down? Yes. So if Satan's able to take the best and the brightest, how many of us would say I'm better than David? My heart is after, I, my heart is David, oh, I'm more passionate in my love for God than David. How many say they're wiser than Solomon? No, we aren't. But do you know what God says? There's victory in Jesus. The Bible says, as we walk in his ways, we are blessed, we are protected. Listen, Satan's alive and real. It's those little, Solomon said, the little foxes spoil the grapes. So often we think, oh, it's a little sin. And like the boa constrictor, right? It's all right at first. But as every time we do it, it tightens down on us. And tighter and tighter. And every time we do it, we get, aren't you thankful for God's word? I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. We live in a world where Satan has mastered it. And he's using all these assets to try to deceive us. But Christian, I'm just challenging you. Be aware of your enemy. He's a deceiver. He's a liar. Satan wants to destroy your marriage. He's working on destroying your marriage right now. He's working on destroying your relationship with God. He's, destroying, uh, he's working on destroying your prayer life. He's destroying, he's wanting to slowly destroy those things. But every day you wake up and you say, God, I'm going to be used of you. And God uses you to administer grace, the balm of Gilead, to bring healing to your marriage, to bring healing to your, to, uh, to bring peace, to bring blessing to your home. As for me, my house will... 
Don't you love, don't you love Hannah? She just said, hey, I'm going to serve God. And did God work through her to bring blessing to Samuel? Yeah. Is there victory? Yes. But is Satan trying to defeat us? Yes. Shall we stand?